Welcome to the Napoleon Hill Foundation's Motivational Audio Theater. The drama you are about to hear is about riches and an ancient secret of how to find riches. For our tale is very old indeed, and yet its lessons are as new as today. In your imagination, come with me to ancient Babylon, the setting for our tale, as we meet the richest man in Babylon, and as he tells us his secret. This man of Babylon has the name of Akrad. He is very rich. The fame of Akrad is known far and wide, for he is a generous man in all his ways. He is generous to his family, to charities, and lives a rich and lavish life of the best of families in Babylon. And yet, it has been said that his wealth grows more rapidly than he can spend it. When the famed Akrad gathers with his friends of younger years, you can hear the chorus of amazement and curiosity at Akrad's growing wealth. You, our friend Akrad, are more fortunate than we. You have become the richest man in Babylon while we all struggle for existence. Why, Akrad, you wear the finest silken garments and enjoy the choicest of foods on your table. But we, we are slaving away to earn just enough to clothe our families in ordinary clothes and give them the basic of food each day. Yet, dear Akrad, once upon a time we were all equals together. We learned from the same master and played the same games. In our studies and games in those days, we were all equal. You were no better than us. And as citizens of this city, all of us have been equally honorable. And, dear Akrad, all of us have worked these long years equally as hard. Then why, Akrad, is it that fickle fate has shown with overflowing blessings upon you and given you all the good things of life, while she ignores us, we're just as deserving. Speak and tell us. I will certainly tell you, my dear friends. If you have not acquired more than a bare existence in these years since our youth, it is because you have not learnt the true laws of how to build up wealth, or else you have forgotten them. And fickle fate is a vicious goddess who brings no permanent good to anyone. She showers unearned gold, but ruin too. She makes wanton spenders of those who soon dissipate all they receive. They are left with ravenous appetites that they cannot satisfy. Then there are others who are not spenders, but are misers. They are the ones who hoard and fear to spend, knowing they cannot replace their wealth. They also fear others will rob them of their hoard, and so live lives of emptiness and secret misery. There are those, of course, who can take unearned gold and add to it, and live a life of a contented citizen. But these men are few and far between. Think, my friends, of the men you know who have inherited sudden wealth, and how few there are who can truly make it grow to give them all they need and more. Dear Akrad, there is great truth in what you say. We spend our riches and we fail. We hoard our riches and fear to live. But how, friend Akrad, did you not fall prey to these? How did you become the richest man in Babylon? Let me tell you the secret of my wealth. It all began when I was a youth and knew you all. I looked around me and saw all the good things that brought happiness and contentment. And I also realized that having wealth increased the possibility of all these. I realized that wealth is power. With wealth, many things are possible. I realized in those young years that one may decorate a home with the richest of furnishings. One may sail the distant seas. One may feast on the delicacies of distant lands. One may buy the ornaments of the gold worker and the jeweler. One may even build mighty temples for the gods. One may do all these things and more to delight the senses and bring life to the soul. And in my young realization, I made a decision that I would claim my share of the good things of life. I decided I would not stand by in the envy of the success of others. I would not be content with the cheapest things. I would not be content with being poor or just getting by. I made that decision as a young man. I would make myself a guest at the banquet of the good things of life. But, friend Akrad, these wishful promises of youth were fine. But all of us were the sons of humble merchants. You too. You had no hope of an inheritance in such a large family. You were among the lowest families, and you had no special schooling or wisdom or special powers. Exactly, friends. It was because I had no special benefits 
that I realized if I was to achieve what I desired, time and study would be required. Time and study. Time, dear friends. All men have this in abundance. Each of you have let slip by sufficient time to have made yourselves wealthy, yet you admit that you have nothing to show, except your good families, as wonderful as they are. As for study, don't you remember our wise old teacher telling us that learning was of two kinds? The one kind being the things we learn and know, and the other kind is the knowledge and skill to find out what we do not know. So, my friends, I set out to find how I might accumulate wealth. And once I did, to make that my task and to do it well. For, my friends, don't we have to enjoy the fruits of our labors while we dwell in the sunshine of life? Soon enough we will depart for the world of the spirits, where we must leave it all behind. But tell us the secret of how you did it, of how you learned what you did to find generous wealth. Well, as you know, when I was a young man, I found employment as a scribe in the Hall of Records. For long hours I labored day after day, month after month, writing and transcribing for customers on clay tablets. But the longer and harder I worked as a scribe, I had nothing to show, no profit from all the toil and days of work. My earnings just seemed to disappear with food and clothing and penance to the gods and all the other things that absorbed my earnings. Yet my determination did not leave me. Go on, go on, Akrat. Well, one day, Algamish, the moneylender, came to my workplace and ordered a copy of the Ninth Law. I remember still his long white beard. Young Akrat, these tablets, I must have them in two days. And if you complete the work by then, I will give you two more coppers for your work. So I began the long work. I labored all the night and day. But when Algamish came back for his tablets, I had not finished them. I could tell he was angry. If I had been one of his slaves, he would have beaten me. But I summoned up all the courage I could, and I spoke out to him. Algamish, you are a very rich man. Tell me how I may become rich, too. Do this, and I promise by dawn tomorrow that all my writing on this clay will be finished for you. <laughs> well, you are a forward businessman, Akron. And I like your boldness. Well, it's a bargain, then. Finish my work by sunup tomorrow, and I'll tell you my secret of success. All through the night, I worked at those tablets until the smoke of the candle wick made my head ache and until my eyes could hardly see. But when he returned at sunup, I had completed the job. Now, tell me what you promised me, good Algamish. You have done well indeed, Akrad. Indeed, I will. And you know, let me sit here. I'm becoming an old man, and the old tongue loves to wag. <laughs> and listen carefully, for the wisdom of age and experience is like the fixed stars that shine upon them to steer their course. Listen closely, young Akrad the scribe, or you will think that your night's work has all been in vain. My lesson for wealth is this. I found the road to wealth when I decided that a part of all I earned was mine to keep, and so with you. Is that all? That was sufficient to change the heart of a sheep herder into the heart of a moneylender that you see sitting here. But all I earn is mine to keep, isn't it? Oh, far from it, my friend. Did you not pay the garment maker? Do you not pay the sandal maker? Do you not pay for the things that you eat? Can you live here in Babylon without spending? Tell me, Akrat, what have you left from your earnings of last month? What have you still in hand from last year? Fool! You pay to everyone except yourself. You end up only working for others. Tell me, young Akrat, if you kept one-tenth of all you earned, how much would you have in ten years? Well, as much as I earn in the whole of one year, I imagine. Every gold piece that you save is a kind of slave to work for you. Every copper it earns is its child that can also earn for you. If you would become wealthy, then what you save must earn, and its children must earn. In this way, your abundance grows. 
<laughs> you think I'm cheating you for your long night's work, but I'm giving you a thousand times over the worth of your work if you grasp the truth I tell you. So listen again. A part of all you earn is yours to keep. It should not be less than a tenth, no matter how little you earn. It can be as much as you can afford. Pay yourself first. Don't buy from the clothes maker and the sandal maker more than you can pay out of the rest, and still have enough for food and charity and penance to the gods. For you see, my young business friend, wealth, like a tree, grows from a tiny seed. The first copper you save is the seed from which your tree of wealth shall grow. The sooner you plant the seed, the sooner the tree will grow. And the care with which you water that tree with consistent savings, the sooner you may rest in contentment beneath its shade. And then he picked up his tablet and was gone. So I decided to try this wisdom for myself. From every piece of copper I earned, I hid one away. And the strange thing was, I was no shorter of funds than before. I noticed little difference as I managed to get along without it. Sometimes, though, as I saw my hoard grow, I was tempted to spend it as I walked through the marketplace, but I wisely stopped myself. It was about twelve months later that Algamish returned to my workshop. Well, it is good to see you, Akrad. And how, may I ask, is your savings plan going? Have you paid to yourself from your earnings not less than one-tenth of all you have earned for the past year? Yes, Master. I'm proud to say I have. That's very good. And what have you done with it? Well, I have given it to Asmur, the bricklayer, who told me he was voyaging to Tyre, across the ocean, and he would buy for me there the rarest jewels of the Phoenicians. When he comes back, we shall sell the jewels for the highest price and divide the earnings. Oh, that's so foolish. Why would you trust the knowledge of a brickmaker about jewels? Would you go to a baker to consult him about the stars? No, if you're not a fool, you go to the astrologer if you had the power to think. You are so foolish. Your savings are gone. My dear Akrad, you have plucked your wealth right up by the roots. Well, every fool must learn, so go ahead. Plant another try again. And next time, if you're going to invest in jewels, consult the jewel merchant. If you want to know about the worth of sheep, go to the herdsman. Advice is free, but mind that the advice is worth having. And it was just as the wise and wealthy Algamish had said. For the Phoenicians eventually did sell worthless bits of glass to Asmur that looked like gems. But I began again, resolving to learn from my loss. I saved each tenth copper. It had become easier. For now it had become a habit to take part of all I earned for myself to keep. It was no longer difficult. Again another year had passed, and old Algamish came to the scribe's workshop to check up on how I was doing with my investments. Oh, my son. What progress have you made since last I saw you? I have paid myself faithfully, and my savings I have entrusted to Agar, the shield maker, to buy bronze. And each fourth month he does pay me the rental. That is good. And what do you do with the rental? Well, I, I had a great feast with honey and the finest wines and spice cake. And soon I'll buy myself a young horse to ride. <laughs> you certainly eat the children of your savings. Then how do you expect them to work for you? And how can they have further children that will work for you? First, you have to get yourself an army of golden slaves, and then you can have as many rich banquets as you like. After that day, it was a long time before old Algamish returned to visit me. When he did, I noticed that he was getting very old. His figure stooped. Deep lines in his face. Well, Akrad, have you achieved the wealth you've dreamed of? Well, Algamish, not everything I've wanted, but some I have, and it earns more, and its earnings earn more. And do you still take the advice of the brickmakers? <laughs> About brickmaking, they give good advice. Good, good. Akrad, you have learned your lessons well. You first learn to live upon less than you can earn. 
Next, you learn to seek advice from those who are competent to give it. And lastly, you have learned to make gold work for you. You have learned how to acquire money, how to keep it, and how to use it. And so now you are competent for a responsible position. I am getting old. My own sons think only of spending and nothing of earning. My affairs are now too much for me to handle. So my dear Akrad, I want you to go to my fields for me. They are in Nippur, and there you will look after my lands and estates. When the value of the lands increase, so shall I increase the gold I will pay you for your efforts. And so that amazing change came about. I went to Nippur and took charge of Algamish's large and rich lands. I was full of ambition and had mastered the three laws of successfully handling wealth. In this way, I was able to increase greatly the value of the lands and properties. And when old Algamish died, I continued to follow his principles and so greatly increased my own holdings. And that, my dear friends, is how my wealth has grown. How lucky you were that old Algamish made you the manager of his lands. Lucky, my friend, that I already had the desire in my heart, even before I met him. For four years I labored with a definite purpose of keeping one-tenth of all that I owned. Now, you wouldn't call Lucky the wise fisherman who went about studying the habits of fish so he could net the largest catch, would you? Opportunity will fly past those who are unprepared. Oh, Akrat. You must have had strong willpower to keep going after you lost your first year's savings. Most people would have just given up. Willpower? What nonsense! Do you think that willpower gives a man the strength to lift a burden the camel cannot carry? No, willpower is simply the unwavering purpose to carry a task you set for yourself right through to its fulfillment. If I set a task for myself, however small and trifling, I shall see it through. In what other way will I find the confidence to do more important things? When you set out to do a task, follow it through. Say for a hundred days I walk across a bridge into the city, and I decide I will cast a pebble into the stream each time I cross. And so I would do it. I wouldn't put it off and say, tomorrow I'll throw a pebble into the stream. Nor even on the twentieth day would I make the excuse and say to myself, Akra, this is useless. What does it profit you to throw a pebble into the stream each and every day? Throw a handful and be done with it. No, I would not say that. Neither would I do it. When I set a task for myself, I complete it. Akrad, what you say is true, and it is reasonable and simple. But if everyone followed these principles, then there wouldn't be enough wealth to go around. Ah, but my friend, wealth only grows where people exert energy. If a rich man builds himself a beautiful palace, is the gold that he has spent on it gone? No, the brickmaker has part of it, and the artist has part of it, and everyone who labors on building the house has part of it. Yet when the palace is complete, is it not worth all the cost? And isn't the ground on which it stands worth more than it had been before because the palace is there? And aren't the adjoining lands worth more because they surround the palace? No, wealth grows in many ways. No person can tell the limit of it. Haven't the Phoenicians built great cities on barren, empty coasts with the wealth that has come from their ships that trade the ocean? So, our friend Akrad, what is your advice to us so that we may become rich like you? We are getting older and have nothing put by. I repeat to you the wisdom of old Algamish. Take it to heart and say to yourself, a part of what I earn is mine to keep. Say that to yourselves when you rise in the morning. Say it at noon. Say it at night. Say it each hour of the day. Say it to yourselves until the words are forged upon your mind. A part of all I earn is mine to keep. Keep this rule in your mind. Fill yourselves with this thought. Then take whatever portion seem wise, but let it not be less than one-tenth, and lay it by. Arrange your other expenditures so that this happens, but put aside that portion first. Soon you will realize what a rich feeling it is to own a treasure upon which you alone have a claim. As it grows, it will energize you. A new joy of life will thrill you. Greater efforts will come to you to earn more. 
Then learn to make your treasure work for you. Make it your slave. Make its fruit, its children, and its children's children work for you. Ensure an income for your future. Be aware that you will grow old. So invest your treasure so that it will not be lost. Counsel with wise men. Seek the advice of men whose daily work is handling money. Let them prevent you from falling into the same errors I did in giving my money to the brickmaker Azure to invest. A small return and a safe one is far more desirable than risk. Enjoy life. Don't overstrain or try to save too much. If one tenth of all you earn is as much as you can comfortably keep, be content to keep this portion. Live according to your income, but don't get mean and afraid to spend. Life is good, and life is rich with things worthwhile and things to enjoy. And so, dear listener, you have heard the story of the richest man in Babylon, Akrad. That day in ancient Babylon, his friends thanked him for his advice and went their way. Some of them were silent because they had no imagination and could not understand. Some were sarcastic and cynical because they thought that someone as rich as Akrad should share his riches with old friends that were not so fortunate. But some of Akrad's friends had in their eyes a new light. In Akrad's story, they realized that the old man Algamish had come back each time to Akrad's workplace because he was watching a man working his way out of darkness into a new light. With the passing of time, Akrad saw the light a little more fully, and when he had found the light, a place awaited him. No one could fill that place until he had, for himself, worked out his own understanding, until he was ready for opportunity. And so the wise listeners to Akrad, who put these principles into practice, would return in the following years to visit him, and he received them gladly. He counseled them, and gave them freely of his wisdom. He gave them wise advice. He helped them to invest their savings so that they would bring in a good interest with safety and would neither be lost nor entangled in investments that paid no dividends. The turning point in the lives of these few men came upon the day when they realized the truth that had come from Algamish to Akrad and from Akrad to them. And now, dear listener, to you and is still so true today that a part of all I earn is mine to keep. You have been listening to the drama The Richest Man in Babylon. Before you switch off this tape, here is a short review of the main points of our story. Some questions are suggested for your own reflection and application to your life. Lesson number one. In our drama, Akrad is quizzed by his friends on why he has become so prosperous and successful and they have not. Akrad tells them that they have not learnt the true laws of how to build up wealth. What is your financial plan? Do you have one? Is your financial plan succeeding? Lesson number two. Akrad, as a youth, decided that he would claim the good things of life. He wanted and desired success and prosperity. He also set himself to the task of studying and learning how to make riches. When Akrad first worked as a scribe, he worked long and hard with no financial profit for himself. Yet he was determined to succeed. How determined are you to succeed? How determined are you to succeed financially? What time and study do you devote to this task? Lesson number three. Akrad's determination remained strong as he took the bold and aggressive step of asking old Algamish, the wealthy customer, the secret of his success and wealth. The simple principle that old Algamish shared with Akrad seemed too simple at first that a part of all I earn is mine to keep. Algamish's advice is that Akrad first put aside one-tenth of all that he earned for himself 
before he spent money on other expenses? Do you seek advice from people with experience? Does the principle, a part of all I earn is mine to keep, relate to your life and way of doing business? Lesson number four. Akrad begins to try and carry out the principle of a part of all that I earn is mine to keep. At first he begins to find that it does work. Though he is tempted to spend it, Akrad puts aside a tenth of his income before he pays out other expenses. But as Algamish finds out on a later visit to Akrad, the money he has saved was foolishly given to a brickmaker who said he would buy jewels for Akrad on his travels. This money, of course, was lost. Algamish lectured Akrad for not seeking professional advice from competent people. Algamish encouraged Akrad to learn from his own mistakes. Akrad began over again to save a part of all he had earned for himself and his savings. Do you spend time in seeking professional advice on investments? Do you learn from mistakes by seeking advice from competent sources? Lesson number five. Akrad's savings gradually became a habit, but still there were problems. For on another visit to Akrad, Algamish discovers that Akrad has made a wise investment of his savings. He has loaned his savings to the shield maker for a fee, but the profits that Akrad has received, he has wasted on rich food and wine. Do you consider carefully where you can invest your profits? Lesson number six. Algamish corrects Akrad again, insisting that Akrad make sure his savings work for him. And so slowly Akrad learns to live on less than he earns. He slowly learns how to acquire money, how to keep it, and how to use it. Old Algamish is pleased with the growing success and discipline of Akrad and leaves his lands and properties to him. Do you review the successes and failures of your business history so as to plan future investments in profitable ways? Lesson number seven. The advice of Algamish to Akrad throughout our drama was learn to make your treasure work for you. Make it your slave. Make its fruit, its children, and its children work for you. How do you make your money work for you? Does your money really work and multiply for you? Lesson number eight. The essential secret of the success of Akrad is a secret that he learned slowly through much trial and error. It is the principle of keeping one-tenth of all he earned for himself and using this in wise investments. Strong willpower and discipline brought Akrad wealth and success as he learned the secret of the richest man in Babylon, that a part of all I earn is mine to keep. Thank you for listening. This has been a production of the Napoleon Hill Foundation's Motivational Audio Theater created to motivate you to your possibilities and success.